All right, and away we go. Hello, hello. This is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And today, we're going to be talking about ways to get better at mixing faster. Much better at mixing much faster. Are these shortcuts? Am I going to give you my 10 shortcuts to learning to mix better faster? I don't know. I don't know if you want to call them shortcuts or not. But there are absolutely ways that you can approach this whole thing that will make you s- slow down <laughs> the time that it takes to get good at mixing. And I've definitely been in position in my career in audio where my progress felt like it was inching along. And I listened back to mixes that I had done months before, and I've said to myself, am I getting better? And honestly, sometimes we stagnate. Sometimes we really do hit plateaus when we're going through this whole thing. But if you take into your practice these 10 approaches I'm going to give you today, I have no question that the speed at which you improve at mixing, and not just mixing, but everything that you do in audio and music production is going to increase dramatically. I know this not only from my own personal experience and from interviewing tons of high-level music producers and audio engineers over the years, but I've also coached countless students in mixing, music production, audio engineering. I do a lot of mix coaching these days, both as my work as a mastering engineer and just as a mix coach. Some people hire me for that. We just do coaching calls together. And these are the things that I see really make a difference. All right, enough preamble. Let's start getting into them. First, if you're here for the live stream, let me know in the comments and the live chat there whether you can see me and hear me. And as we go along, if any of these stand out to you and really resonate with you or something had a big impact is, uh, on you, please let me know. And if you want to add your own additions to this, I love to hear from you guys. So feel free to type them into the chat and into the comments. Uh, we'll talk about sponsors later. Uh, for now, I'll just let you know that they're GPU Audio, giving away some free plugins at gpu.audio slash Sonic dash scoop. That's gpu.audio slash sonic dash scoop. Also, Loudon Audio, look for the link in the description. This mic you can get for 50 bucks off this month, and Sound Toys making some of my favorite stuff out there. Uh, try out their stuff for free at soundtoys.com. All right, more about those guys later. For now, more about you. How do you get better, better at mixing faster? All right, here's the number one thing that we obviously can't ignore is that there is no substitute for actually mixing. So this is thing number one. You actually have to mix. You actually have to do a bunch of work with your hands on fader, with your ears on records, actually putting in the work. Put in your quote unquote 10,000 hours. I don't know if it really takes 10,000 hours to get good at mixing, to get results where you're happy with what you're doing. I haven't really broken that down. I think one of these days it might be nice to make an estimate of that. But for now, yeah, you've actually got to put the hours in, however many hours those might be. But with that said, all of the other things on this list help. And as we go further along, we're going to get to the most powerful things. And I think when we get to numbers eight, nine, and 10, man, these are absolutely some of the most powerful things for improving faster. So obviously there's no substitute for doing the mixing, but one of the things that gets in the way of us actually doing the mixing sometimes, and I have to throw this out there as part of number one, is spending too much time watching other people mix. Watching other people mix is not us mixing. Watching other people record and produce is not us recording and producing. And to give an example here, I think a lot of people know this deep down in their bones, that just watching other people do it is not the best way to get faster. It can be informative. My goodness, we have a whole series on called MixCon, where we go under the hood of major producers, engineers, mixes. We go under the hood of commercial releases from platinum selling mix engineers, from Grammy winning mix engineers. And those are entertaining and they're useful and you can pick up additional tricks. But these things potentially get in your way if you're using them as a substitute to you actually doing the work. And this reminds me of a bit that we covered in an episode of the podcast a little while back called Why You Don't Have a Career in Music. And one of the big things, one of the big mistakes that people make when it comes to making their own music is they talk about it before it's finished. Like they turn all this energy that they should be putting into their music 
and they turn it into talking about their music. And it's almost like you've gotten your reward, you've gotten your free dopamine hit from talking about all the music you're going to do, and it makes it take that much longer for you to actually do it and finish it. And a similar thing can happen if you spend way too much time watching mixing tutorials, specifically watching other people mix. It's not to say there's no place for it, but you need to do more mixing, not more of watching other people mixing. But number two is the one big thing that I think is going to dramatically help improve the time that you get out of putting into mixing and the time that you spend watching other people mix. And that is having frameworks in place, mental frameworks for what you should be doing in the mix, for how to use specific tools, for what's most important in the mix. And that's why that's what I focus on mostly on this channel. I do some mix tutorials. I do things with audio examples. You find me on the Plugin Alliance channel showing off their plugins. We'll have sponsors come on and Fab Filter did a whole series where I take you through, you know, with before and after examples, how I EQ things in mastering, how I compress things in mastering. I've done the same kind of things with mic techniques and all sorts of processors. But even when I do those audio examples, I try to lead with, all right, here's the mental framework. Here's the way to actually think through how you're going to do this stuff. Because I know that makes more of an impact than just watching me tweak knobs. Because if you watch me tweak the knobs on a compressor for 30 minutes without having any clue of what I'm trying to accomplish with it, what you should be listening for, all of that time could be completely wasted. But if I proceed five minutes of me playing around with a compressor with 15 minutes of me saying, okay, here's exactly what I want you to listen for when I start playing with this dial. Here's exactly what I'm trying to achieve. Do you have it in your head? Do you have the mental scaffolding now that you're going to put these audio examples on top of? All right, now let's listen to some stuff for five minutes. That five minutes of listening you do is going to be way more powerful than the 30 minutes, 40 minutes, or an hour of listening you might have done without that proper mental scaffolding in place without the mental framework for how this stuff works. And although one of the biggest complaints I get on the podcast is, dude, all you do is talk. And it's like, yeah, it's a podcast. What do you want me to do, dance? That said, I, I get it. I have a lot of podcast episodes. I do it once a week. I don't do an audio example video every week, but I do a me talking to you episode every week. And one of the complaints is, why are you talking? And I'm like, I write back to them, it's a podcast. And they write back, oh, I didn't know that was a podcast. It's cool. And I don't say the part where it's like, didn't you hear the first words I said of the Justin Coletti Sonic Scoop? Thanks for tuning into this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. I guess I should like repeat that podcast part several times. But even though that's the, the biggest criticism I get, I keep on doing it because I know it's one of the things that helps people the most. And I think that a lot of you out there recognize it. And I'll give you an example, our MixCon series, where we go under the hood of some of the best mixers working today, their actual mixers, the way they work. Our most popular one is with Bob Power. Maybe some guys, some of you guys have seen it. Let me know in the comments below if you've seen the Bob Power MixCon appearance. That video has about a million and a half views right now. And for the first 30 minutes, at least about half of his mixing masterclass, he just talks about what mixing is about. And people love it. He does go into the audio examples in the second half, so people felt, feel like, oh, I got my money's worth. He showed me the inside of Pro Tools and opened up plugins. But I think a lot of people really do recognize that so much of the value they get of it, so many of the insights are front-loaded. And then after they get through his overall framework, there's some additional fun tricks that you pick up along the way, and you should do some washing of other people mixing. I'm not saying not to. It's just that having the mental frameworks in place is more important still. So these are the two big first things. They're the most obvious. And as we go along, we'll get less and less obvious and we'll get more and more into specific things you can do. Now, number three is the first of our really specific things. And that is to do deliberate listening exercises to improve your sonic recognition, to improve your ability to hear specific features of audio. So a couple of examples here for what deliberate practice might look like. Getting to really hear the difference between slow attack setting and fast attack setting on a compressor. Getting to really hear the difference between 
a slow release setting and a fast release setting on a compressor. This is one of the first major exercises I give in the course, compression breakthroughs. And it's one of these things that I know is absolutely invaluable to people. And they go through this exercise where we do these before and afters and we level match things and we get really tedious. And we're like, okay, we're just going to train our ears on this one aspect of compression. And once you can hear the difference between fast attack and slow attack compression, fast release and slow release compression, all of a sudden compression makes sense. And if you want to go into extreme detail and really hear compression for the first time, if you've been struggling to hear it, check out the full length course, Compression Breakthroughs at compressionbreakthroughs.com. But that's just an example. This can be applied to anything. I'd love to make some additional processor courses in the future, and I'm kind of working some up, but this also applies to EQ ranges. You do not necessarily need by memory to be able to distinguish 1K from 1100 hertz. You don't necessarily need to be able to distinguish 300 hertz from 400 hertz or 320 hertz from 480 hertz. It doesn't have to be that granular. But at the very least, you should do some listening exercise that help you distinguish frequency ranges where you can hear something and go like, oh, that's in the lows. That's in the mids. That's in the highs, right? That's step one. Step number two is, oh, that's the lows, but I think it's more the sub bass region versus the upper bass region. Oh, that's in the highs, but I think it's in that extremely high air band versus kind of our lower highs that might be around 8 or 10K. You don't have to necessarily know the difference between 8K and 9K, but you should get a feeling for like, ooh, we're in that area of it's somewhere between 7K and 9K or somewhere between 8K and 10K, that area-ish. I know it's not that area of 12K to 16K. Like those should have two specifically different feelings to you, the extreme upper high band and the lower highs, the extreme subs and the lows. And also the same thing in the mids. You should be able to have like at least low mids, mids, and high mids, or from your perspective, I guess that'd be low mids, mids, and high mids, if you're watching this on video. And you can get maybe slightly more granular than that. Maybe if you get really good, you can split up low mids into two categories. The low, low mids of, you know, 200 to 300, and the upper low mids of like, you know, three, 400 to five, 600. So breaking things down into those ranges and doing listening exercises that are able to make you say not exactly what frequency to reach for, but what general part of the color palette of frequencies we're reaching for. That kind of deliberate ears on listening, in addition to just the mixing you're going to do, is going to help. Another couple possible exercises for you, reverb times. Can you identify them by ear? Did that sound more like 800 milliseconds or more like three seconds? Those two things should sound really different to you. Does that sound more like 800 milliseconds or 1.2 seconds? That's something you should be able to differentiate. Can you differentiate between a second and 1.2 seconds? It becomes fuzzier. You don't need to be super precise, but at least you should be able to break up your reverb decay times into general categories of here's really short stuff. Here's my stuff that's around a second. Here's my stuff that's substantially longer, like two seconds and longer, to at least be able to differentiate by ear those three categories. And hopefully, you maybe can break it down to four or five categories, depending on how granular you want to go. You don't have to guess it down to the second. Same thing with delay times and pre-delay times for delays to when you're listening for something, well, first of all, hopefully you're a musician enough that you know the difference between eighth note, uh, quarter note, dotted quarter note, dotted eighth note, 16th note. Those should be things that you're able to hear as rhythms. But if you don't have a musical background, just being able to differentiate that is going to help you tremendously in selecting delays. But beyond that, for our less specifically rhythmic delays, you should know that 40, 50, 60 hertz delay time totally different than 80, 90, 100 hertz delay time. Totally different effect on you. And hopefully you can get a little bit more granular. Do you have to know the difference between 50 milliseconds and 55 milliseconds by ear? No. But you should at least be able to zero into some of those ranges. These are some concrete goals that you could start doing listening exercises for. And to tell you the truth, in my future processor courses, I'll probably, I, I am working on doing some more exercises like that. For now, if you want that applied to compression, check out Compression Breakthroughs. And if you want the frameworks we were talking about in the beginning, check out Mixing Breakthroughs, where there's like a framework for all of mixing, so that all of your exercises in mixing 
start to mean more. All right, our next thing, number four is do deliberate mixing exercises. We just talked about deliberate listening exercises that are going to help you improve your ability to kind of hear, hear and recall things. And let me know in the comments or in the live chat which of these things you're able to do and which of these things you think you might want to work on, you think might help you out. But deliberate mixing exercises, this is different than deliberate listening exercises. A deliberate mixing exercise would be some of the stuff like that I prescribe in Mixing Breakthroughs. I'm sorry to keep on talking about this courses again again. It's not meant to be a hard sell. If anything, I'm giving you away for free some of the stuff that's in the course right now just to be useful to you. But one of the big things about Mixing Breakthroughs is, yes, there's a whole section where I do a bunch of mixing and we have like five different genres and five different DAWs and you can watch me mix and show you every last thing I did in the mix. But I almost put those in just to make people feel like they got their money's worth. Because again, I know the value in it is front loaded. And some of the value in here is in the mixing exercises. And here's a mixing exercise for you right now. It's one of the first ones that I give in the Mixing Breakthroughs course. Here, you can have it for free. It's really easy. It's really simple. Start a mix. Take a mix that you've already done and undo everything. Just bring it back to where it started. And now try to remix that song using nothing but level and pan. That's it. You're not allowed to touch an EQ. You're not allowed to touch a reverb. You're not allowed to touch a compressor. The only tools at your disposal are level and pan. Try mixing an entire song using nothing but level and pan. Oh my goodness. If you don't get in there within 30 minutes, two hours, and say, wow, I took this mix almost as far as I did last time using nothing but level and pan. Like all of the relationships are there. I would say within 30 minutes, you could be surprised how far you go. But the first time you do this, you might want to spend two hours on it, four hours on it to try one of several different approaches. What does it sound like when I make the vocal, like the most dominant centered thing and make the snare drum my secondary instrument. And what happens if I change that? What if happens if I change that relationship where the vocal and the bass become the most prominent things in this song? So just focusing in and giving yourself these limitations, some of the further exercises would be take that mix that you've done and now do a pass of it You've already established your levels and do nothing but use EQ. You're not allowed to use compression or reverb or anything else. And see what you can do in one 30-minute to one-hour session using nothing but EQ on that same mix. You're not allowed to do anything else. That can be extremely instructive, especially if you already have a framework in place for how you're going to go about using EQ. That's something we go into in the Mixing Breakthroughs course, and we can go into it in uh, future courses on EQ, which uh, should be a lot of fun. But that idea of doing deliberate mixing exercises, another big way to get better faster than you otherwise would. I really think that if you took someone who spent a thousand hours just mixing songs, they would get better at mixing songs. But if you took someone who spent, you know, 800 hours mixing songs and 200 hours doing this kind of deliberate practice and installing these frameworks and mental models into their mind, that second person would sound, their stuff would sound possibly twice as good as the first person, even though they spent technically fewer hours actually mixing actual tracks. Because they did the right kind of listening exercises and they got the right frameworks installed in their brain. All right, number five here. This is another type of deliberate exercise to do that I think is going to totally change the way that you hear your mixes and totally change the way that you hear music, period. It's going to improve everything that you do, not just in mixing, but in producing, as a player, as an arranger. But before I give it to you, the one thing I've got to give you is, as always, this is a free podcast. How are podcasts free? You know how podcasts are free. One of the ways that they're free is that we have sponsors. And big shout out and thanks to... This time, Loudon Audio. Go over to bit.ly slash Loudon 208 dash 50 off. That's bit.ly slash Loudon 208 dash 50 off. All this month, you can get this microphone, the Loudon 208, for 50 bucks off. It's a fantastic mic. It's a front address condenser microphone. Similar profile to something like the Shure SM7B that's over my shoulder there. But I think it's going to be better sounding on most voices and probably your voice. 
I like the sound of this way better than my Shure SM7B. And there are places you can use this thing that you wouldn't use a Shure SM7 because you have the additional detail of a condenser mic. It's much more suitable a mic for things like miking up acoustic guitar, for using as a single point mic or part of a or a pair of them for things like uh, drum overheads. Um, for things where you want to get really natural picture of things like uh, brass or strings. You you probably wouldn't record a string player with a Shure SM7B, but you could do it with this. But it also handles extremely high SPLs where you could put this thing in front of a kick drum, in front of a roaring guitar cab, and is extremely good in that application as well. So definitely check out this mic. It's the Loughton 208. Let me see if I can do some visual aids for those of you guys who are on the... Um, video version of this and we'll do some visual aids of these guys here is our web sharing yeah Loughton 208 microphone let's bring it up on the screen thanks to those guys for sending this over like i said 50 bucks off all this month you can use it on a great a lot of great applications another big shout out if you want something totally free not just a discount check out gpu dot audio slash sonic dash scoop. And they are giving you guys a totally free bundle of plugin effects that work on the GPU in your computer. They've just added this space and time bundle. Again, free for a limited time. There's a convolution reverb in there, the space and time bundle and a modulation bundle as well. Check these guys out over at gpu.audio slash sonic scoop. And you will get a whole bunch of nice free stuff. Let me go back to my uh, main mode here. Oh, and one more big thing, Sound Toys. Let's see if I can bring these guys up on screen, soundtoys.com. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. One of my favorite makers of plug-in effects out there. So big thanks to those guys for being sponsors. But honestly, the most important sponsor on this podcast that makes it so that we have as few advertisers as possible as you. And the best way to sponsor this podcast is sponsor yourself. Check out one of the great full-length courses if you're into them, compression breakthroughs, mixing breakthroughs, mastering demystified. Links for those in the description down below. Uh, definitely uh, check those out. But also, if you want something really inexpensive, you can right now become a member of this channel for $5 a month. I don't know how long I'm keeping it at $5 a month. We have a whole bunch of members right now in the live chat. I'm going to give some of, the street, uh, some of them a shout out. Who we got here? We got Ant-Man Felix joining. We got Skeleton Pete joining us. New member just added during the stream, Kenneth Daniels. Thanks so much for becoming a member. Absolutely great to have you here. Music 7 Studios is here. Um, Craig Flowers just joined recently. There's Skeleton Pete. Whole bunch of members. I should do a member shout out section. And one of the things the members are going to get uh, this Coming week, next week, for all of your members, remember, we are doing our next mix feedback session. So if you haven't submitted already, you can shoot me an email or respond in the comments for any of these with the words mix uh, member uh, mix feedback or member mix critique, and I will load that up for our next mix feedback session. We're going to listen to tracks together, and we will give you really specific advice of exactly what you can do in your mix. Hey, your vocal should come up by a dB and a half. Hey, your kick drum needs more 5K in it. Hey, these guitars, that one guitar is maybe panned a little wide. We'll get that specific that nerdy, that granular, and we can even listen to your records next to some of your favorite releases to hear how they compare, and we can go through some kind of test mastering settings. Can you believe that you have access to that for $5 a month in addition to live Q&As, and I'm adding constantly to the library of free videos that are members only in there. The members only side of the Sonic Scoop YouTube channel keeps on growing. I keep on calling back some of the videos that are available to the public and making more and more of them members only. So if you really love to OD on this podcast and you want to see every single episode in video form, the only place to do that is on the member side. Click the join button at the bottom here to become a member or if you're not getting the join button coming up on your screen and you don't see it down there, it's because you're on an Apple iOS device. And for some reason, uh, you can't join directly from the iOS device. I think it's because Steve Jobs' ghost wants a cut of uh, you know, the membership fee and YouTube doesn't like that. So you might have to click the link and do it in a browser instead of in the YouTube app. All right. Enough of the shameless, shameless plugging. Um, were they good plugs? Let me know. How am I doing with the plugs? Too long? Too short? Do you like it? GPO.audio slash Sonic Scoop over there. All right. 
Now we're back on to the meat of this. We were about to do number five, which is this one that is absolutely going to change the way that you hear your music and the way that you hear other records forever. And that's to do reference listening exercises. Listening exercises where you take your commercial releases and listen for specific things in them to see how they handled the same types of problems and the same types of issues that you deal with again and again. And this is one of the scariest things that I I bring up again and again in this podcast that beginners are too afraid of doing because they know when they hear their stuff next to their favorite releases, it often doesn't stand up. And that's okay. We all go through that. But listening for the gulf between where you are and where your how your favorite releases sound is a big part of the process for bridging that gulf, is to acknowledge that it's there. We often don't get a lot of objectivity in art and music. But if you really have a clear goal for how great you want things to sound sonically, and you're falling short of it, it's not feeling impressive to you in other places, you know that there's a problem. So many of the solutions exist in the work that has already been done by others. But you have to learn what to listen for. And I give a whole bunch of reference listening exercises in the Mixing Breakthroughs course, exercises that you can do so you can compare your work to others and like get something out of listening to other people's work. But I'm going to give you some, again, just totally free today, some of the reference listening tricks that you can employ right now. And I've actually done an entire episode about this one. I believe it's called The Most Important Thing in Mixing is Not What You Think It Is. So if you Google Coletti Sonic Scoop, The Most Important Thing in Mixing, you're going to find it. And it's all about the idea that mixing is not about making everything be heard equally at all times. That's competent mixing. That's basic mixing. That's the kind of mixing abilities that will allow you to start earning, if you're trying to do this professionally, maybe $200 per song that you're mixing. But the people who are earning $700 a track, $1,000 a track, and more to mix are not making everything be heard equally at all times. Forget about the money aspect of it. The mixes that you love the most, that like pull at your heartstrings the most, that like have a big impact on you, that make you feel things, aren't doing that. The mixer, the producer is not saying, we have to make sure everything is being heard equally at all time. I'm not sure if I can 100% hear that shaker as well as I can hear that bass guitar or vice versa. We have to, no, don't do that. The best mixes that you will listen to have focal points. Usually, here's the way that I like to conceptualize it for you. There will usually be a set of tier A instruments. There'll be one or maybe two tier A instruments, your top tier instruments, that are the focal point of either that mix or that section within the mix. The focal point can potentially change from section to section. Your focal point in your chorus could be different from in your verse. But in every given moment in the song, what are the dominant things? It's usually going to be vocal and something else. Not always. There are some genres where vocal will not be the main focal point or some mixes or some styles where the vocal is actually not on your tier A list, but 90% plus of the time, vocal is going to be one of them. And 80% plus of the time, the other one is going to be maybe snare drum. That's often the other instrument in a lot of pop mixes and rock mixes. In some cases, it could be kick drum. That's often our other top tier instrument in things like hip hop. It could be bass. There's certain songs where the bass is just like objectively way more important than the kick drum and vice versa. And sometimes one of those two elements, your kick drum or your bass is up there, tier A instrument. And to be honest, there's probably more tracks outside of hip hop. There's probably more tracks where bass is a tier instrument than kick is. And then you have your second tier of instruments. This could be anything. Your snare drum or your bass or your kick could be in the second tier, or they could could not even be there. I mean, you're an acoustic guitar. In some tracks, it could be acoustic guitar and vocal are the most important thing, and they're both A tier. But in another track, acoustic guitar could be a B tier instrument. But there's also this third tier, your C tier, your tertiary tier of everything else. So there's usually your top tier A instruments, 
one or two of those. Your tier B instruments, where they are your main supporting elements that support your tier A in instruments. And then there's the everything else, where their job is to add color and character and flavor and intrigue without getting in the way. It's not their job to make themselves known, but it's their job to maybe enhance the groove of the song, the feel of the song, the atmosphere of the song, and for those really deep critical listeners to serve as extra ear candy and additional dimensions to discover. So that's one thing to listen for in a mix. Categorize a whole bunch of your favorite mixer, mixes. And not just a whole bunch of your favorite mixes. Things that you don't think are like hi-fi sounding mixes, but like they're songs that move you so much. You'll still discover that the same kind of thing is often happening. There's so many other things you could listen for. You could start using references to do some of the other listening exercises we were talking about, like listening for reverb times and delay times. Can you start listening in for how long that reverb is or how long that pre-delay is or how long that delay is on that reverb? Can you start to listen thing to, for things like the kick drum? What is the fundamental on the kick drum in this track? Bring up a frequency analyzer if you need to. Do the same thing for bass. What range is this bass occupying? Could you guess? Did you guess 40 hertz and it was 80 hertz? That's a difference you should be able to learn to hear. Hey, the bass in this song is occupying that 80 to 90 hertz range primarily. That's where its bottom is. Just even to be able to hear that thing of, hey, this bass is more in the upper bass and this kick is more in the sub range or vice versa. To be able to distinguish those kinds of frequency range solutions that people are doing. So many more listening exercises we can go into around references. I don't want to make this podcast like many hours long like my courses are. So go to the courses if you want many hours of doing some of these listening exercises together and giving you even more concrete ideas. All right. And now we're going to get to the most powerful things for making your mixes sound better instantly. Numbers six through 10 are going to have more impact than any of the stuff that we just talked about. And you're going to hate some of these answers. But the better you get, the more you're going to learn to love them. Number six is arrange better. The best mixes come from the best arrangements. I often talk, when I do an episode on low end, I talk about that idea of you can't have two instruments both being the lowest. Right? If you're trying to juice up a whole bunch of 50 hertz on your kick and a whole bunch of 50 hertz in your bass, and they're both trying to live in that area, it's going to be a mess. If the kick and the bass are both speaking primarily at 100 hertz, they're going to be a mess. And there's things you can do with EQ to kind of separate these things out and make sure that the bass is more in the upper bass region and the kick's more in the lower bass region or, or vice versa, depending on the particular song. But the best way to do that is with arrangement with the parts that these instruments play, with things like sample selection, with things like choosing the right type of instrument for the job or the right register on the bass. And it's not just kick and bass. It's other things like vocals. Are there elements in the verse that are distracting from this narrative story we're trying to tell with the verse? Are they getting in the way of the lead vocal? Or are they coming in at the right spots so that they're coming in between phrases? So they're almost answering a question posed by the vocal. Arranging things so they don't get in the way of the vocal is one of the best ways to make sure that the vocal doesn't compete with other instruments and other instruments don't compete with the vocal. And you can hear them both because they play at different times. Or if you have two different guitars or a guitar and a keyboard, can they have slightly different rhythms, even if they're playing at the same time? But you really want to be able to distinguish them. Sometimes having complementary rhythms instead of identical rhythms can help separate them. And if you pan them, give you tremendous stereo spread. If you're not careful, too much stereo spread. And can give you things that sound distinct without you having to pull out a whole bunch of mixing tricks. Just selecting the right tones. If you're going to have two different guitar parts Selecting two different guitar tones that each occupy their own space, and then using some of those arrangement tricks to make sure that they're filling in the gaps of each other instead of walking all over each other, or one is emphasizing the other. The best mixes come from the best arrangements, and so many of these things we try to fix with EQ and sidechain filters and level rides, man, would work so much better if the arrangement worked better. And sometimes, as a mixer, if you are hired to mix somebody else's stuff, 
you might be able to make some of these suggestions, but that's tricky. Often, if you're the producer or you're mixing your own stuff, you have much more leeway to do this, to say, you know what's best right now? If I just start muting some tracks. We did an episode recently about Rick Rubin and one story that I wish I'd put in there uh, that I didn't put in there. We give the top 10. I do a lot of these top 10 lists that actually go to 11. Um, The top 10 insights from music producers from Rick Rubin, one of the stories I I did not include in there was when he was working with Kanye West, I think on the Yeezus record, and his job with Kanye was just to like mute a whole bunch of stuff to make the track sound better. And... Fortunately, he, he trusted Rick Rubin to do that, but it's, it's very hard to be in that position, particularly as the mixer on a project where you can make some of these executive decisions around arrangements. But if you're having trouble getting your own stuff to sit really well, consider this, that the answer might not be EQ, it might be parts. Before you go reaching for that side chain ducking filter to make your bass duck, duck every time your kick hits, it's like, Did you pick the right kick and bass parts and registers? All right, number seven. You're going to hate this one too. The next thing is going to make you better at mixing. But this is one of the things that makes me better at this day at mastering. I do mastering all the time these days rather than mixing. And this is the thing that makes me better at mastering. And when I was mixing, it was the thing that made me better at mixing. And it was work with better musicians. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's true. Honestly, even like your arrangement can suck and your recording can suck and like your mix can suck. But if you have a heartfelt performance from an amazing musician who's like communicating to you, oh my goodness, you don't need all this stuff to work. I did a podcast episode called Great Songs with Bad Mixes. You should look that one up. It's a lot of fun. Great songs with bad mixes. One of the examples that just came to mind as I'm saying this is The Mess Around by Ray Charles. You ever seen that one? Made Immortal by, uh, or heard that one I mean? Made Immortal by uh, John Candy, like miming along to it while he's driving a car in the middle of the night in planes, trains, and automobiles. Anyway, The Mess Around by Ray, Ray Charles. The mix is objectively terrible in the sense that it doesn't sound very hi-fi. And when the piano comes in, the mix is practically nothing but piano. And when the vocal comes in, the mix is practically nothing but vocal. It's totally dominating everything else. But it so doesn't matter. It's such a great, energetic, heartfelt performance that has such energy and emotion behind it. Who, Who cares? Work with musicians who have something to say, something to say with music, something to communicate. And your mixes will instantly improve. And I say this to you not just to say, well, get better at playing music if you're doing your own stuff or stop working with such sucky bands if you're working with sucky bands. But I also say it so that you don't beat yourself up if one day in one project you're like, man, I'm getting good at this mixing thing or I'm getting good at this producing thing. It's really coming together. I'm not so bad at this. And then you do another project and you're like, oh, I suck. I haven't learned anything. I'm moving backwards. Like my skills have gotten worse. Maybe I once had the touch, but I don't. And this is the one where they're going to find out I'm a total hack. Sometimes that's just you, you know, jazzing yourself up in your head and second guessing yourself. But sometimes it's because the song actually kind of (laughs) sucks. I'm sorry. Or like the performance isn't that compelling. And you still try to do your best on these things, right? I mean, I get projects to master some of the time where... Let's just say they're closer to the beginning stages, the, the self-improvement stages of their craft or the, the early improvement stages of their craft, because hopefully you're always improving. Self-improvement and this stuff doesn't end. But they're more at the, the early stages of their story of improving as a musician than they are at the later stages. They're not fully developed yet. And even if things were recorded properly and the arrangements theoretically work, there's something that's just not there. They're just not fully far formed artists yet. And it makes me feel like my work sounds less good, but it's not the sound of the work. It's like the timing of the band. It's some of these other things. Maybe it's arrangement. Maybe it's, we'll get to in a minute, how it was recorded. So when you are just the mixer on a project, 
know that how good you feel about your results is going to change dramatically depending on the quality of work that you get in. And mixing, I, I hate that I've led with this episode it being about mixing. I lead with it being about mixing because that's what people click on. But all these things we're talking about, every single thing we've talked about so far on this list applies at every stage of the process. And some of those early stages are much more important. The songwriting stage, the becoming a compelling performer stage, the actual performance, the arrangement, the recording, all of these things can have a better, a bigger impact. And in an ideal world, all those things work so well that the mix is almost just a formality where it's adding 10 or 20% to it. Our second most popular mix con video is with Mick Gazowski. Uh, he actually takes us under the hood of a Jamiroquai track. And that one doesn't have as many views as the Bob Power one. The Bob Power one, a million and a half views where he starts off by just giving you mental frameworks about mixing. This Mick Gazowski one, he sits down and says, hey, I'm Mick. Um, here's Jamiroquai track. Let's start by hearing the kick drum. And he does a whole bunch of before and after. And that's useful. But one of the frustrating things to people is that they're like, well, the tracks already sounded great. Like, of course the mix sounds great. Sure, like you made the kick drum sound a little bit better and a little bit more defined, but like it already sounded great. Now it just sounds a little bit more great. Like, how is that helping me? And the reality is, yes, that's where great mixes come from. They come from all that other stuff. We obsess about mixing too much because sometimes for a lot of us, it's the first part of the process where we stop and we slow down for a moment and we think and we try to make like good informed choices and we're not in a rush and we're not just trying to get the thing done, but now we're sitting here, you know, stewing with and do, finally doing all of our critical listening and our important decision making. And we're just doing it for the first time now at the mixing stage. And that's why people are searching for mixing, mixing, mixing. How do I get better at mixing? The same thing happens in jujitsu. I, I hate to bomb you with too many jujitsu analogies, but there's a choke called the rear naked choke. If you've ever seen MMA fights, you've probably seen this. This is where someone gets behind someone else, right? And they, 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 they do a blood choke. And one of the most commonly searched questions in the world of jujitsu among beginners is, how do I escape a fully locked rear naked choke? And it's like, well, you messed up way before that. There's someone on your back with their arms around your neck and they're starting to squeeze. Like the best way out is tap and you're done and you restart the match and it's over. But it's still one of the most searched things because it's like that's where people realize something went wrong. I know now something went wrong because I'm being choked unconscious. Clearly this is the issue I need to work on. And that's what happens with a lot of us in mixing is we get to the mixing stage, we start finally doing our real critical listening then, and we say, my problem must be mixing. Because this is where I'm actually stopping to realize that something went wrong. But it wasn't that. You're just like the winner of an MMA fight or a jiu-jitsu match is determined long before, honestly, people even step into the ring, in a way. And definitely right before the last knockout blow is hit. I'm sorry if this is too violent of an analogy for some of you. I'm not actually a big MMA guy. I'm much more of a, just a pure grappling guy. But ju just as those matches are settled long before that final submission hold is put in place, whether or not your production is working is determined long before the mixing stage occurs. And this brings us with number eight, which is have better recordings. And because I talked about this so much during number six and seven, there's not much more to talk about around number eight, but better arrangements, better musicians, and better recordings will 100% make your mixes sound better than all of the things that I talked about earlier on this list, as important as all of those earlier things are. And now here's where we get into some of the, one of the other things that's going to annoy some of you and make some of you very happy. Another aspect of number eight here is work with better engineers in better studios, in better rooms. That's one of the ways that you get better recordings. If you were trying to do everything by yourself in your bedroom, you actually can't. Some people make beautiful sounding records that way with enough practice and often with enough treatment in the room. And 
honestly, if there's things that's lacking in their performance, it's not that big of an, a, a deal if they really got the arrangement right and they really got the performance right. We're willing to forgive some of these other issues in recording quality. But this is one of the things where you can improve number six, seven, and eight, even if you're a do-it-yourself bedroom producer type of person, by bringing people in for specific parts of the process. Like, do not be afraid to bring people in for number six of helping you with the arrangement. What if you had a co-producer on a track who has done gorgeous sounding tracks in your genre, in your style, who's made great choices that you really admire with sample selection on electronic drums or with writing string orchestration parts or with, you know, arranging pieces in an interesting way for rock band in this rhythmic style that you just, you're like, I have the song. Can you help me flesh it out? You can do that with arrangements. You can do that with working with better musicians. Like what if you hire in a better drummer or a guest percussionist? I was working on a coaching call with someone just the other day where they had a guest percussionist on the track and it sounded phenomenal. Like immediately I could tell that was a pro percussionist. And the only problem with the percussion track is it was a little bit too loud in the mix because the person himself who mixed it was like, this is the best performed part on this whole record. I mean, other parts were really good as well, but this one stood out as sounding like, whoa, that sounds like what all the percussion parts I've listened to on like my absolute favorite record sound like. It has that vibe. And he jacked it up maybe a tiny bit more than he needed to and made it slightly more apparent because it was so good. And just hiring in people for one or two little things who, who are amazing at their craft can have an, a big impact on the feel of the entire rest of the record. If you hire in a bass player, you could probably find some amazing bass players who aren't you for very little money on the internet or through your friend network who are going to dramatically change the groove and the tone and the impression that your track leaves. And this leads me to number eight for recordings, you know, hiring out some of the recording part, like going to a nice studio to record your drums or having a, an acoustic instrument recording day. Like you don't have to do everything yourself. And on your favorite records, whether they're done at an indie level or a super high end major label record, there's usually more than one name in the damn liner notes. And this is not me telling you don't be DIY at all. Like DIY is good to a degree. Like you should not feel like you need other people to get started or to do things. You should be self-contained enough that you're like, I can do this. I don't need anyone's approval. I don't need anyone to tell me it's okay for me to start doing this music. I don't need everything to go right and for me to work with all the best people for me to keep on putting out great records. You should be that DIY. But you should also recognize that there are people who are better than you at certain things. And if there's some way where you can get them into your project, it's going to be good for you and it's going to be good for them. And it's going to be good for end listeners. If it's your goal to have end listeners, which I hope it is, even if you don't want to be mega famous. And I, I think honestly being mega famous for most of us is a stupid goal. Like I'm honestly more famous, I am internet famous. I'm not, not really famous, but even me, I'm more famous than like I need to be for quality of life. And if I could have fewer people know who I am and still make the same income, I, I would. But even if you don't like want a ton of people to hear your music, you should want some people to hear your music. And if, and you want those people to really feel something like, isn't that why you're doing this? And if getting other people involved can help you make that better, it's a good thing. All right, on this idea of getting other people to work with you, number nine, some of you people are going to hate this. And some of you are going to really realize that this is going to change everything for you. One of the best ways to get better at mixing and to get better mix results right now is to hire someone else to mix for you. That's number nine. Oh, Justin, that sounds like such a cop out. I'm here trying to get advice from you about how I can get better at mixing. Okay, I got a couple of things for you there. First thing, why? Why do you want to get better at mixing? Are you trying to be a musician? Is that like your main goal? If your main goal is that you want to be a musician or an arranger or a songwriter, 
all the time you put into your craft of mixing is time that you're not putting into your craft as a musician or a songwriter or a ranger or a, you know, a singer, a performer, whatever it is. You should be putting as much of your energy in as possible to get really good at those parts of the process you care most about. So for you, hiring a mixing engineer and not doing everything yourself is smart. But there may be another reason that you want to be the mixer, mixing for other people who wish that they could be doing all those other things instead of mixing. That's another good reason to do it. Why would you hire a mixing engineer to help you finish one of your projects? So you can learn from them and steal their tricks. So you can compare your mixes to their mixes. In some cases, I actually had some clients recently who hired a few different professional mixers to mix their album. They actually hired one professional mixer, really high-end guy, actually done a MixCon presentation. I'm not going to say who, did tremendous mixes on this. And they hired somebody else to mix some of these songs. And they picked and cho chose between those two mixers. But also, for some of the songs, they chose their own mixes that they did themselves. Man, what kind of confidence boost that must be if you want to go forward mixing yourself in the future. That you're like, wow, actually some of my mixes stood up to the mixes of these other people. We each had a different approach, but mine were, were good. Man, if you can get there, beautiful. But if you can't get there, you can hear the difference between yours and theirs and say, wow, the mixing stage can take things even further than I'm taking it. Sure, maybe the ideal mix is just adding 10 or 20%, but these guys added 30% and I'm adding 5%. I don't have to be so shy anymore. Or, oh, they realized something I didn't realize, that the most important part of the groove here is the bass, and they emphasize that more. And here I am emphasizing the snare drum. I was totally wrong. They were right. Or, oh, they had such a better approach to the vocal effects on this song. Those are things you could learn by hiring someone else to mix your stuff, even if you're also going to mix it. Here's another one. Maybe if you get with the right kind of mixing engineer, they will tell you everything they did and they will show you everything they did and they'll let you look inside the session. Now, please don't do this. Don't take someone else's mixes, open them up in your DAW, make a couple of small changes and say, you mixed it. Like if you're working with a producer or an engineer or a mixer who's done substantial work on your mixes, even if you feel like you deserve a mixing credit yourself because you really did change some significant things, like give them a co-mixing credit. Be honest. And, and honestly, it's not going to make you look worse to have a co-mixing credit. Like imagine there's two scenarios here. You want to mix for other people in the future. Scenario one, you have an album, the mixes sound great. They were actually 90% done by some other big name mixer and you added a little bit to it and then you put your name on it. That's one possibility. Possibility number two, you hear these amazing sounding mixes. You did some of it, this big name mixer did some of it and the album note say, says, mixed by this big name mixer and you. I've got to say, as your prospective client, I'm actually like, oh, wow, you worked with Big Name Mixer? They were actually the person that I wanted to hire for this, but they were only five times more expensive than you. Uh, that's cool. You must have learned some stuff from them. Like, you have this social proof from having your name alongside theirs. They're like, oh, you like studied along with this person? Like, sure. I expect that you're not as great as them, and that's why you're both on there. But like, there's actually extra weight of having that co-mixing credit. But some people will potentially show you, walk you through, tell you, uh, maybe in, if you're working with them remotely, you might have to spend extra for a coaching call where they might go through, you know, give them the rate for an hour to kind of go through the broad strokes of how they approach things differently than you did. That can be an amazing thing to be added onto a project, to get mixed coaching and mixed feedback from a favorite mixer. And this brings me to number 10, best way to improve at mixing faster. And that is to work with a mastering engineer, a human mastering engineer to get feedback and tricks and insights into what you do. This is probably one of the biggest values that my mastering clients get from me. A lot of them are totally thrilled just by like, oh, Justin, it sounds way better 
I'm amazed. Like you, you, it sounded okay before. And I, I didn't know it could sound as good as you made it. I get that feedback sometimes, particularly on those projects from people who are more towards the beginning of their journey than the end of their journey, right? There's more room for improvement so I can dazzle them more. On people who are really well-developed, sometimes I'm doing a lot less. But regardless of who it is, someone near the beginning of their journey or the end of their journey, not the end of their journey, a later stage in their journey, there's no end to this stuff. You know it. Some of the, the best feedback I can give to those people, and especially at the beginning, beginning, beginning stages, is telling them exactly what I did. And if they wanted their final master to sound even better, what they could change in their mix. Like, hey, one of the things I tried to do was to actually tuck back the snare drum a little bit relative to where you had it. And I only have so many tools to do that in mastering, but I try to de-emphasize the snare drum a little bit because you're actually pushing it a lot harder than in so many of your favorite releases. So that was one thing I was trying to contain. Or I love how wide you went. We did a project together in the past where it sounded like practically mono and I was encouraging you to go wider, but you've gone so wide this time, but honestly, a little bit too much. You could dial it back by like 10% and you're going to find that sweet spot. And one of the things I did was tuck in the edges a little bit, particularly in the high frequencies. These are just possible examples of things that happened like in the past day, right? On <laughs> some masters that I did. So getting that feedback from a mastering engineer, even if you're not going to work with an outside mixing engineer, it's less expensive to do with a mastering engineer, but hearing the before and after. And even if you're in a position where the mastering engineer barely does anything, that's a great thing to know. And I've got to say, some of the students that have learned from me the most and the fastest have been my mastering clients, where they bring a record to me, they ask me everything that was wrong with it, or that could be improved, and I give them my top votes for here are the things you can focus on the most. They bring me their, my, their next record, and there's half as much to say, because they've integrated all of those ideas. They bring me the next record, and like their third record in, it's like they're as good as some of my best clients, and I'm barely doing anything, because it's like... You got it. You made a mix that sound like a mastered finished commercial record. It's beautiful. And um, you, you still have to pay me even though I'm doing one-tenth as much as I used to. So that's number 10 is working with a human mastering engineer. Hey, if you want to add to this list, type into the live chat if you're here or into the comments. If any of these resonated with you in particular, I really like to excerpt those out. But I'm going to give you my additional ones here. We still have this list goes to 11. So you're still going to get the 11th big tip here. But before we get to number 11 on this list that goes to 11, if you have anything to add, I might do a quick readout of some of the live chats that come in. Uh, or if you want to enter this in the comments, if you're listening to this after it goes live, I read every single one of the comments. I respond to those that I can. If you want guaranteed replies from me in the comments, then become a member of the channel. Right now, it's only five bucks a month. I don't know how long I can keep it that cheap. That's just such a steal. You get guaranteed answers to all of your comments. You get access to the live Q and A's. You get access to the mix feedback sessions and a whole bunch of exclusive videos. So if you've gotten this long, particularly if you're in the live chat, I don't know why you're not a member. Our next week, we are not doing a public live stream. We are only doing our live stream for members, which is going to be a mix feedback session. So next week, you're going to miss me unless you are a member. All right, I'll look for your comments coming in now. But before I do, number 11. These lists always go to 11. And this one is get your monitoring together. Everything that we just talked about becomes so much easier if you can trust what you're hearing. And I'll only harp on this one super briefly because I talk about all the darn time, which is one, improve your room with acoustic treatment. Two, add on to that by using some EQ correction. And number three, have good speakers you can trust. And all three of those things to going together are a system. So don't have a budget for just one of those things. Have a budget for all three of them. If you have $1,000 to spend on monitoring, don't spend $1,000 on monitors. Spend $1,000 on monitoring and acoustic treatment and maybe EQ correction. Uh, having really great headphones if you're on a limited budget. If you only have $300 to spend on speakers, you could get $300 speakers or you could get amazing $300 headphones that are really good. There are some gaps and potential issues with just mixing on headphones, but if you get ones where you can trust, trust the low frequencies, you can actually be in really good shape. You also have to learn your monitoring. And here's a nice thing. Even if your monitoring is really bad, you can learn it. And that requires referencing both inside your studio and out. We have whole episodes about that, so I won't go into much more detail. And then our last thing, 
number 12. Did this list go to 12? Yes. And the number 12 way you can get better at mixing is to forget about everything that I just told you. I want you to learn the mental fra frameworks. I, I want you to do the listening exercises and the mixing exercises. And then I want you to throw it all away. I want you to trust your feelings. That sounds almost corny to say, which is why I have to pause for a long time to let you know it's serious. Trust your feelings. Don't just listen for how impressive things are and whether the EQ is right and whether other engineers will be impressed with your mix. No, listen to the whole song and say, does it move me? Do I feel something? What's the emotional arc of this song? Am I enhancing the emotional arc? When I go from the verse to the chorus, is it lifting? And do I feel like it's still developing? So by the time we get to the second or third chorus, we haven't blown away all of our tricks yet. Like there's something left for the second or third chorus to happen and to develop and to rise. And that regardless of how nice the bass sound is, is it at the appropriate level where it's like, either staying out of the way of the kick drum, if the kick drum is the most important part of the low frequency groove, or whether you're really being unafraid to push it, even if it's an ugly sound. You know what? Go uglier. Don't make it pretty. Make it even uglier as long as it's like the most, it's supposed to be the most important thing and noticeable. It doesn't matter if it's ugly. It matters if it's grooving and if it's appropriately focused. So listen to the whole song. Zoom out. And ask yourself, how do I feel? And what could make me feel this section more? Trust your feelings. Because sometimes you may go back and listen to some of your earliest work where you knew so much less than you know now. And in a way, it sounds better, even though it doesn't. Because there's this authenticity there. So your mixes don't need to be perfect to be good. They need to make people feel something to be good. And I want you to remember that. All right. Looking in the chats here, I don't think there's so many additions for additional tips. I think we're kind of exhaustive here. We're almost into the hour mark on this particular podcast episode. No, we've just gone over an hour. Hour long podcast. I hope you dug this one. I do want to mention a couple of quick additional things. Uh, big shout out and thanks to our sponsors. I want to remind you, I can get you some free stuff and some discounts. 50 bucks off this mic. Are you liking it for the podcast? The Loughton 208. I think it sounds better than the mic I was using before because it's actually doing a better job of rejecting the sides. Even though I'm in a really well-treated room, I was using before this a wide cardioid condenser that I also like the sound of. And I love that I could turn off access from it and I wouldn't hear my voice dropping in level as much. But what I would hear was more room because of that wide, wide cardioid pattern. But with this mic, with this really tight cardioid pattern, I feel like there's so much more focus. I hear the room less. It sounds even tighter and more professional to me in here because of that directness. And just that change of the microphone going from wide cardioid to super cardioid in here had a big impact. But also, I just think the sound of this one is really nicely tailored for voice and for a lot of instruments as well. If you want it for 50 bucks off, go over to this link, bit.ly slash Loughton 208 dash 50 off. They're 50 bucks off this month. I think it's a great bet. If you want something like a Shure SM7, that large diaphragm dynamic over my shoulder, but you want it to be a condenser that you can use in even more places with great rejection on the side. So it works well for live environments as well. That'll make your room sound tighter and drier and more professional. And you can use it on more detailed sources because it's a condenser. Definitely check it out. Uh, I've been really happy using this one. Let me know what you think of it in the comments down below. Also, GPU audio. I should adjust uh, this link. It should be gpu.audio slash sonic dash scoop. That's gpu.audio slash sonic dash scoop. New link here. This one is going to get you a totally free bundle of 
time-based effects like delays, of modulation effects like phasers and flangers, of an amazing convolution reverb that run on the GPU in your computer, freeing up system resources for track counts and things. The GPU in your computer is an underutilized resource. It's almost like having dedicated DSP inside your computer that you just aren't using, that you could be using if you get the GPU audio stuff. Also, they have a whole bunch of talks going on at the Innovation Lab at NAM coming up. I'm going to be at NAM. Any of you guys going to be at NAM? Let me know in the chat. Maybe we can meet up. Maybe we can have a Sonic Scoop meet and greet for members at NAM. I will be there. Hopefully, some of you guys will be there too. And uh, I'll be hanging out with the GPU audio guys uh, there as as well as with some others, including Sound Toys. These guys are definitely, I'm looking forward to seeing them at NAM. Sound Toys making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. We've got a whole bunch of Sound Toys, con the Sound Toys content out in this channel and more coming up soon. Whenever they're doing a mini sale these days, we're helping them create some new content. So if you want to know about Sound Toys sales, make sure that you subscribe to their YouTube channel, but make sure you subscribe here because every time they're running a sale these days, we are doing some content on the channel to go along with it. So you'll be among the first to find out. So hit like, hit subscribe, hit that notifications bell to make sure you don't miss any videos. And also go to sonicscoop.com, sign up for our newsletter there. You don't want to miss things like the great giveaways we have going. We give away more than $100,000 worth of free gear every year. And we really do have real lucky human winners and you can be one of them. There's often one going on at sonicscoop.com slash contest. And if you want to know about them when they happen, go to sonicscoop.com. Last but not least, best way to sponsor this podcast, if you've listen to this entire episode. You're going to love being a member. Hit the join button down below or go ahead and uh, if you're not, if you're on an Apple iOS device, you may have to go to a browser and hit the join button there. But um, tremendous value. And next week, we will not have a public live stream. It will be a members only live stream. We will do mixed feedback and mixed coaching. If you want some of the best mix coaching available, not only can you book me personally into Master Your Records, but the courses, my goodness, the most useful things I've ever done in my life. Sponsor yourself. Check out Mixing Breakthroughs, Compression Breakthroughs, Mastering Demystified if you haven't already. The links are in the show notes down below. Thanks again for hanging out with me. Oh, Craig just joined. Thank you for uh, joining. Dark Trap just joined. We just got a new member in here as we're going along. Dark Trap just became a member, so big shout out and thanks to you. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for hanging out with me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. See you next time.